you are when I was your age, I never got to go to school and attend a headbanging concert. It just didn't happen. All right, continuing on with your education about the Scots Island. Slide. This is all about education. All right, live on the Oast Plantation. In 1613, the town of Derry, Ireland was renamed London Derry because the London companies took it over. They were putting all the money to us, so they changed the name. In the same year, the building new walls around the town began. The walls are completed five years later. Today, the walls survive almost intact, and it's possible to walk along their full length for just over one mile. You can literally walk on top of the wall all the way around the town for a mile. The walls are the most important surviving 17th century fortifications of the British Isles and well worth a visit. Slide. Alright, now those granted land were required to build a, a fortification on the land. The simplest type of fortress is known as a bond. The word bond comes from the Gaelic word for cow fort. A bond was a courtyard surrounded by strong walls and was usually square or rectangular. Alright, the reason they had to have a cow fort, cows were money. Just like in the American West, Back in the 1800s, people would go and steal your cows because cows were money. So when somebody raided their land, they actually had to bring their cows in basically to their house and keep it safe so they could stole Now the most important New English and Scottish landlords were expected to build a strong castle as well as a farm. The ruins of some of the castles built by the undertakers for the plantation counties have survived. In County of Florida, it's possible to visit Monet Castle. Probably the finest surviving plantation castle. It was built by Malcolm Hamilton, one of the uh, Scottish undertakers. That's a picture of it right there. Slide. Now, new towns. One of the big changes brought about by the plantations was the establishment of new towns. Some of these towns were more successful than others. The largest towns of Plantation Ulster were in order of size Londonderry, Coleraine, and Strawbank. The London companies were in charge of building the towns of Coleraine and Londonderry Grove. In County Tyrone, James Hamilton, that's a picture of him right there, who was the Earl of Abercorn, established a town in Strawbank. Now, many of the landowners were not wealthy enough to establish a town, and so they founded a village on the land instead. You had to have some pretty serious bank to build your own town. A lot of you guys couldn't do that, it's just a very small village. Slide. So in the 1600s, it was copacetic to be Presbyterian in Northern Ireland. In 1707, however, the Act of Union United Parliaments of Scotland and England, and it was not long before policies emerged with unsettling consequences for Presbyterians in Ireland. Okay, 707 Act of Union. What country did that create? It created the country of Great Britain. There was no Great Britain before that. There were the individual countries of Scotland, England, and Ireland. Now, the same king or queen would rule all three, but they were their own individual countries. And finally, the British said, okay, this is stupid. The same guy or girls in charge of all these countries, let's just unite them. We'll call them the United Kingdom or Great Britain. And that's where Great Britain came from. Now, in 1711, legislation was an act restoring the right of patronage in all of Great Britain. This returned the power to landowners and town councils who nominated ministers to vacant church parishes, thereby re removing the right of call from congregations. So now the church is forced to get this pain again. Okay, the whole reason that these Scots went to Ireland was so they could determine what the church was going to do. Not anymore. Now they even said, nope, not happening. We're going to tell you who your, who your preacher's going to be. So your grandparents have scholars from Northern Ireland, so they could be Presbyterian, but the English just pulled an epic sight on you. Slide. Now the Enforcer Queen Anne's Test Act in 1703 caused further discrimination to all those who did not participate in Anglican or Episcopal Church and caused considerable numbers of Ulster Scots to migrate to colonies in America throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. In fact, these Scots Irish from Ulster and Lowland Scotland comprised the most numerous group of immigrants from Great Britain and Ireland to the American colonies in the years prior to the American Revolution, with an estimated 150,000 plus leaving Northern Ireland at the time coming to America. Slide. According to a Kurt Miller in his book, Immigrants and Exiles, Ireland and the Irish Exits North America, Protestants made about one third of the population of Ireland, but made up three quarters of all immigrants leaving from 1700 to 1776. And 70% of those Protestants were Presbyterians. So the people emigrating from Ireland to America in the 1700s were Protestant Presbyterians. 
Now, the term Scots and Irish is first known to have been used to refer to people living in Northern Ireland. Upon the arrival of North America, these migrants at first usually just identify as simply as Irish, without a qualifier Scots, because we came from, they came from Ireland. Yeah, the grandparents had come from Scotland to Ireland, but they came from Ireland, so that's what they called themselves. It was not until a century later, following the surge in Irish immigration during the uh, Great Potato Famine in the 1840s, that the descendants of the earlier arrivals began to call themselves Scotch Irish to distinguish themselves from the predominantly poor Roman Catholic immigrants coming out. So that's when they started calling themselves Scotch Irish. Slide. So the Scotch Irish started coming to America in the 1700s. Why did they end up here in the Appalachians? It's all about geography. The Atlantic Coastal Plain is a region of low relief on the east coast of the U.S. It extends 2,200 miles from New York southward to the Georgia, Georgia Florida line, which is an awesome country, by the way. The province is bordered on the west by the Piedmont Plateau. It is some of the most fertile cropland in America and was settled primarily by English colonists in the 1600s. So they got there first, so they took a good land. Slide. Now, the primary colonies of entry for the Scots Irish immigrants arrived at were Pennsylvania and South Carolina, with others going to New York and Boston. Anybody recognize that P up there? Anybody know what university that's from? Princeton, Princeton Tigers. Princeton University was founded by Scots and Irish Presbyterians who arrived in New Jersey. They founded the university. Now, the sea route to Philadelphia was driven by the important trade that uh, linked those ports with Ulster ports. After loading the American cargoes in Ulster, which were primarily a cotton and tobacco, ship captains filled the vessels with immigrants for the return trip. As more and more Ulster people traveled to America, encouraging tales of widespread opportunities flowed back to Ulster. This migration was steadily into the outbreak of the American Revolution. Slide. All right, these are the. Uh, the sea routes for the uh, Scots Irish that came to America. As some of them went to Charleston, some to Philadelphia, and some to New York and Boston. And the map on the left, in the brown, that shows where the Scots Irish settled. And what is that? The Appalachians. Slide. Now, most Scottish immigrants to America travel in family groups under the headrest system. All right, what the headrest system was. If you were a rich guy here in America, for every one person you brought over from Europe to colonize America, you got 50 acres, guaranteed. So if you could pay for one guy to come over, you got 50 acres. Now, most of these people coming over were not, were not rich. That's the reason they're immigrated. If they're rich, they're gonna send England or Scotland. They were not rich, they're poor. The cost to sail across the Atlantic back in the 1700s was $3,000 in the day's money. So if you want to book passage on a ship from Great Britain to America, you had to pay three grand. And remember, you're coming with your family. So if you got a family of five, you got 15,000, who's got $15,000 in that round? Nobody. So these people had to sell themselves into indentured servitude. Indentured servitude meant, hey, if you will pay for me and my family to sail over here to America, I will be your slave for seven years. The first slaves in America were white colonists from Europe. And they were going to be a slave for seven years to pay that back. Now, once they got done with that, they were free. And they could land themselves. Although about 40% of the Egyptian Turks died. Because they were slaves. So they weren't working in real great uh, conditions. So. Now, land in America was abundant and cheap. Most immigrants could get enough land to support a family uh, through farming, offer only paying like minimum fees and those equipments. The earliest rocks filled the fertile soils of the East Coast, but as the flow continued, late comes had to see land types further inland. The mountainous geography of Pennsylvania's western interior, combined with hostile and Indian habits, encouraged many to turn southwestward instead and do a Virginia Shenandoah Valley. That region of mild climate and fertile soils drew a steady influx of settlers from the 1720s on until they got filled up and then they, they had to go where? And that's what we're going to talk about next. Now you guys can hear some more awesome Scott Sowers music and I'll be back. <laughs> 